morning. We're going to get our program for the morning started. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome Matt and Erica Enright here to our Wisconsin Holstein Convention. Matt, if you would raise your hand, this is the only time you're going to get any of the floor. So that's him in the purple shirt there running away. But uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Erica Enright of Winchester, Ontario. They own and operate Winright Holsteins with her husband, Matt, his parents, Brian, and Audrey Enright. They currently have 220 registered Holsteins and 350 acres of land. The Enright family have bred and owned numerous All-American and All-Canadian nominees with several winners over the years. They exhibited the Junior Champion Holstein at the Royal Winter Fair in 2018, Reserve Junior Champion at the World Dairy Expo in 2018, and in 2021 as well, and then won the Junior Breeders Herd at both the Royal and Expo in 2018. Specializing in elite show genetics, a large part of the operation focuses on developing show cattle and exporting embryos. Erica currently sits on the World Dairy Expo Show Committee. She is a Dundas County Holstein Club President, and she was the Ontario representative on last year's National Canadian Show Committee. Erica has a diploma in agriculture from the University of Guelph Kempville campus. She knew at a young age that showing livestock was her passion, initially showing registered quarter horses growing up before switching to cattle. Erica loves to show and is extremely passionate about their show program. Erica, thank you for being here and the floor is yours. Good morning, everybody. Thank you, and part of my presentation is an introduction, but I think you might have done a better job and a little more in depth than I was going to. First off, I'd like to thank the Wisconsin Holstein Association for having me, and I'd like to thank all of you for being here this morning. Your chance to go on the farm, your chance to sleep in, or maybe you rushed in after chores. Either way, thanks for being here. Um, so when I was asked to do this, I was asked to talk to you guys about a couple of different topics. So we're going to look at growing heifers, show up the program, as well as marketing genetics today. First off, though, I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself and then a little bit about our farm. So unlike most of you, I actually didn't grow up on the farm. I grew up in a town about two hours away from where Matt and I farm nowadays. Um, but my mother did grow up on the farm and a lot of my family members. It was very very prevalent at a young age when I was a big animal lover, and my favorite place to eat has always been in the barn. It was always a joke that it was in my blood. So growing up, I used to show, train, and ride American quarter horses, like was mentioned earlier, um, and that was always something I was very passionate about. I honestly think doing that through most of my youth is about as comparable to what we're doing now without being necessarily the same thing. So after high school, I went on to the University of Guelph Kempo campus and took a diploma in agriculture. So at that time, I took what was called an equine option. So all of my elective courses were equine or horse-based courses, and my core courses were agriculture-based. This was probably the first time I got to really take a look at dairy and the industry and some of the people in it. Um, after after college, excuse me, um, I went back home and worked for a little while. And one of the things that I think really has shaped me or, or helped with the business side of our business these days is being surrounded by many business owners and entrepreneurs within my family. So my dad and stepmom own, or still own, gift and home decor stores, and my grandmother and uncle own a couple of real estate offices, both of which I worked at through a lot of my youth, or my, my younger days, if you will. And both really took me under their wing, um, showing me the business side, the payroll, how business work, taxes, that sort of thing. And we all know in farming, we probably, or myself, do it for the love of the animals. But at the end of the day, it is a business. So that's been very helpful to me in that side, as I do do a lot of that part of, on our farm. It works perfect. All right. So the next thing that we're going to do is I'm going to introduce my team because although I'm the lucky one to stand up here this morning, it is by no means just me. And um, I would say the saying, "There's no I in team," is probably a really good picture of the team right now. So as mentioned, I farm with my husband Matt, and we farm with his parents Brian and Audrey. 
if you look at the top picture, you can see them there. We're very lucky. Brian's still in the barn every day. Um, he's, he's out there helping cleaning around the cows and puttering around, and we're, we're very, very happy to have him there with us. And Matt's mom, she used to do a lot of the milking and did all the books as well. Um, she's since retired, but she can be found at the barn any sort of a sale, event, classification thing. She's there. Now, if we look at the bottom picture, we have a few employees at Winwright, but the two most predominant would be Kyle Henderson and Alex Shabbat. Both of them are full-time. We're very lucky to have them. They're a big part of the day-to-day -day workings of the farm, and they're also a big part of our show team. So you can find them around the barn day in and day out. Um, you probably maybe recognize them from pictures of the show as well. If we kind of break down the roles and who does what, um, we, we do work together as four quite well. We all bring a little something different to the table. Kyle milks most evenings. He does a lot of the feeding and he really oversees the dairy herd. He can be found in the barn most days and if we do have cows on a program, Kyle really heads that department. Um, Alex milks most mornings. She does a lot of our young stock. She helps moving calves, heifers, weaning, that sort of thing. And I've luckily passed on a few of my little office duties to Alex, which she's, she's taken on as well. I'm out most mornings, I would say every morning. Um, I really, really enjoy that. My role on the farm has really, re really revolved in the last few years and developed. I get to spend a little less time in the barn, and it seems like more time in the office all the time. Um, I do any of the book work, bills, import, export. We always joke HR, PR, any of that sort of thing comes through me. Uh, so my office is our showing, and then I also head up our show heifer program with Matt. Matt does most of the feeding, and he really, really does a great job with our baby calves. He he looks over all of that. We do have a few students that help him with that, but he really oversees our baby calf protocols that we're going to look at here shortly. And he sees all of the day-to-day -day duties. Um, I'm sure he'll tell you there's not much that goes on in the barn that he doesn't know about, that doesn't go through Matt first. So there's a few stats about the farm there. They were just mentioned in the introduction as well. We do do some cropping, corn, soybeans, wheat, hay. Uh, we milk in a tie stall to milk 100 cows. We're, we run uh, 14 milkers, seven doubles on a track. We can milk in about an hour and 20 minutes. Doesn't take us too long. It all goes pretty well. So we talked about our full-time employees. We do have about two or three part-time employees or students at any given time. We have two really keen 4-Hers that we're very thankful for that help me with a lot of the calves and the training. And then we do usually keep an intern as well for the show season, kind of February to March, right through to about November. All right, so I did mention there was three different categories we were gonna talk about today. The first one we're gonna look at is growing heifers. Now, we're gonna start from when the calf hits the bar, hits the bar, hits the ground, sorry. We're not going to talk about mating and decisions and breeding today. That's a whole other topic. After that, so the way things work for us, and I am going to dwell on that fact. There's lots of different ways people do a lot of different things, but we are going to talk about how we do things today, what that looks like for us as we're right. Hopefully, at the end of the day, you can find something that you like, something you thought was new, or you could try, and, and what you could win. So for us, when the calf hits the ground, we like to keep it in the barn for 10. I'm going to say for about two days, give or take a week, depending on the weather. Much like you guys, it gets quite cold at home, and we don't like to put our baby calves outside too quick. Um, our calves get a calf guard and a first defense pill right off the bat before they're flushed. Um, okay, so we mentioned that. So our baby calves live in hutches. We quite like our hutches. They work very well for us. So our baby calves will transition once they're good drinkers, thrifty calves. It's a little easier to keep a closer eye on this barn, and then they will move outside. Our calves have milk. Uh, we're going to start the 
come on a bottle and then they're gonna transition to a pail. We like to do that if possible within the first week. It's a little bit easier we find, the quicker we can transition them. So yes, whole milk twice a day. We don't pasteurize our milk. We don't use milk for pasteur. We quite like our whole milk and have their fed a third in feeding, but it is water. So our calves start with about a four pint bottle and they're gonna peak at about 14 liters. So gradually increasing, gradually decreasing. While they're in those hutches, they're on a three choice calf starter, a textured medicated feed. Ours will be 22% of Arena, which is a Cargill department. All of the grains that we speak of today are all free product. We work quite closely with them. And then I am gonna mention as well, we do not feed our baby calves hay once they're in the small hutches. So the next step for us is we're gonna to transition to super hutches. Now, we've tried this a couple of different ways, just trial and error, what works, what doesn't work. We've moved baby, cal baby calves from the little hutches back into the barn in the pens, or even to the open front half of the barn. We just found neither was a great fit. Outside to inside to outside, or maybe those big pens are just a little bit too overwhelming for those baby calves. So this was been a really good kind of in the middle fit for us. And we find they transition quite well. Our calves get a, an internasal uh, enforced when we move them from the small hutches to the big hutches. So they go from those in, that individual housing to groups of about, say, about two or three. Um, when we do move our calves, we like to do it with calves that are basically at the same age, same stage, um, and can carry on together into those hutches. Usually about two and a half months of age is when this happens and we start to wean the calves the next are moved into those super hutches. Um, we like to try and keep the stress level and the change as minimal as we can. So by not weaning them off milk at the time of moving them, we give them a chance to settle before we start to make that change after. While in those super hutches, we do also make a change of their grain. So they go off that textured calf starter and we're gonna introduce a 26% complete pellet. So the pellet's going to be gradually increased, mixed with that calf starter until they're eventually, obviously, on the pellet straight. And hay has been introduced once in these super hutches, and it's given twice a day. Um, they do also have access to fresh, clean water at all times through automatic waters. So this super hutch stage for us is kind of what I call a T in the road. It's going to kind of take us through our next few sections. This is where we kind of start to pick out our calves, who's standing out, who's maybe a show candidate, who's just going to go to more of like a general pop situation, and we start to separate them from their next move. So they're going to be in here till about five or six months of age. And then, like I said, they're going to kind of go left or right, depending on, on where they're going from there. So if we look at the heifer barn, these would be the calves that aren't going on the show program. They're gonna go the 260 foot long open front half barn. They're gonna go into larger groups again on the shavings path. They're gonna stay on that 26% complete pellet twice a day. Hay is gonna go to more of a free choice type scenario where we put a bale in front of the pen and they have access to it all the time. And we will introduce some corn silage, mostly through those winter months, especially those heifers you're trying to get bread. Those, those bread heifers, those young calves, they all will get a little bit through the winter. So that was like a, I'm gonna say a brief overview of our young heifer section. The next section we're gonna look at will be the show program, but I am gonna say if anyone has questions or they want to know anything else, I'm happy to answer questions, happy to talk to anyone afterwards as well.
And what we found was we would feed more of it. We had been decreasing the amount of it, let's say, call it so much through the summer to try and keep that weight off and all that extra energy that we were actually losing growth. So by introducing this pellet, we could keep the grain rate up. Peppers were getting that growth that we thought we were lacking. And in turn, we were having really better sized peppers in the fall. Predominantly our young, our, our March through December, your September cats for young stuff. And we've been doing this the last few years and we've been really happy with the results. So right now you would ask about how much maybe those cats were getting. And right now the heifers in our show barn are getting about eight pounds of grain a day. I'll say <coughs> some are getting all 26%, some are getting 40, and some are getting both. Um, and that's obviously something we look at on a little more of an individual basis, heifer to heifer or pen to pen. But those are our two our two main grains. We often got get asked, like, you must add a little bit of this or a little bit of that, but honestly, we, we like to keep it quite simple. Um, heifers also are getting a free choice hay. We like, of course, first cut. Uh, I'm pretty fortunate that my home office or farm office is just up the driver from the barn. So rather than stuffing the feeders full in the morning, which I know is, is practical and a lot of people that's what fits their schedule, I pop out maybe three, four times a day and I'm able just to pop that hay up. Um, we like to give them fresh hay as often as we can. Everyone gets up and comes hopefully increasing that amount of hay that they're intaking. Um, the other thing I guess I'll mention is if given the option, we prefer round bales. That's not to say that we don't do squares. We absolutely do. But just that hay around those bales, it's a little looser. It's maybe a little easier to access than maybe some of those really tight packed flakes. Try to make it as easy as you can for them. Again, hoping that maybe that hay intake increases. So next thing we're going to talk about is water. But the first thing I'd like to do is take a look at this picture. Now, it's not the prettiest picture of my presentation, but it probably represents the most out of any of the pictures in here. So we talked about what we feed them, but when we feed our heifers, so this is a picture of two heifers, their heads are through a feed out hay feeder, in a feed out feeder tub. We feed our heifers with grain in those blue tubs, and we feed them typically in pairs. The odd time it'll be in three, but together. We don't, we don't separate the heifers and tie them up and give them each a tub. For us, we really like when they eat together. It, it increases competition, aggressiveness. I don't want one heifer to not get up because uh, I can eat later and my grain's still gonna be there. I want her to get up, I want her to eat, or my buddy's gonna eat all the grain. So we feed them right in those tubs. Um, and then once they're done, depending, we're going to look at the two different water programs that we typically use. If we're going to go on a two times per day water, if you look, there's a hose going right into that blue tub, and that's exactly how we're going to water them. So we're going to water with a hose. We pour out all the water lines, water rolls, and all the metal barn, and we simply run it on a hose because I would like to see how much they're actually drinking. And we water them in pairs in those blue tubs. So for us, twice a day water looks like as much water as they can drink, simply that way twice a day. And once they stop, the tub's taken out. The other option is a tub or a trough, just in their pen, free choice through the day. Maybe that guttier heifer that you don't want taking that big drink, um, more on a one on one basis. But those would be our two most common, common water programs that we have. All right, so the next thing we're looking at is exercise. Exercise is super important. You saw the pictures, our, we have nice big pens, our heifers are able to move, they walk on nice hard solid surfaces, um, but that doesn't mean they don't need to get out for a run or some exercise. So we have a little pasture behind the barn that the heifers <coughs> can get out in. And I think it's really important for them to walk and move on dirt and natural ground. So we, there's a few different ways to do it, but the way we do it is we don't let our heifers out overnight. Now I know that's fairly common with a lot of people, but
But our theory is we only let them out, say, once a week or twice a week. When we do let them out, they're at that gate. They're ready. They want out. And we really want them to run. We want them to tone. We want them to build muscle. And when we put them out every night, they just sort of saunter out, walk over the round their feeder and eat hay. They can do that in their pen. So for us, by, by decreasing the number of nights they go out, or maybe in the spring it's during the day, weather dependent, um, they really do. They go out, they run, they buck, they play. And I think doing that for a few hours is far more beneficial than, than just walking around at night and eating hay. The other thing I'm going to add on exercise, and funny enough, when I was going back through this program, I realized I didn't make its own slide for training. Which is kind of odd because that's my department and one of my favorite things. But in the spring when I do start to train the heifers, I always like to do so after a little bit of exercise. Um, I think it's far more beneficial if you can let them get a little run out first and then try to break them. We do talk about breaking them in the spring. I'll leave my heifers probably a couple times a week for those first little bit up into the spring show. And then we have this discussion with our 4-H girls because they're super keen and they want to leave them as much as they possibly can. But after those spring shows, you won't see me out there leading too, too much unless it's maybe something that I haven't shown. I won't leave them, I won't even leave them every week to be honest with you. We'll leave them maybe every other week or maybe once a month or a couple times before a big show. But I just find if we overtrain, they tend to get dull, and I really want that presence. So if I can get a really good start on them, get them quite broke off the beginning, and then give them a break a bit, when they come back out and we start to get ready to show or travel again, they are a little more fresh. They have that presence, and maybe that wow factor that we look for in the ring. The purse is just sort of hanging. if you will, is clipping and washing. <coughs> now, neither of these are my department. Um, I mentioned earlier, there's four of us that <coughs> work together day in and day out on our team, and we all bring something else to the table. So, Alex would be our main washer. She does a great job. She's very aware of the hair and the coat, and she'll buy this product and that product, and, and we totally let her, that's her element. But if we kind of break it down to how much we do it, we would do, I would say, a full wash about once a week. <coughs> and by full wash, I mean with soap. Um, sometimes too much soap can be a bad thing, right? Maybe you can dry out that coat or that hair. And then we really aim to rinse five or six days a week, give or take. Um, sometimes that doesn't always quite happen, but that's always the goal. And I think it's really important to rinse as much as we can. For us, it's done usually in the evening. I know some people, depending on your schedule, maybe in the morning. But if it can be done when it's a, a cooler part of the day, it's far more beneficial. And then clipping. Clipping is Kyle's department. Um, as mentioned earlier, some of you might recognize Kyle. He used to be on the road traveling show to show before he came full time to us. So we really let him dictate how much that happens. And Lynn, I think it was you that posed the question to me earlier, how often do you clip? And I, I thought about it to try and give you guys a concrete number, but I really don't have one, to be honest with you. Unlike washing or rinsing, we really clip on an as-needed basis. And we'll clip everything in the spring. But we do let our heifers get hairy. They aren't, they aren't so clipped all the time. Um, typically about a month or so out from a big show, clip everybody off, give them time to grow back their hair and buzz out nice. And then we really try to clip everything at home before we go to a big show. Um, that's something we're kind of pretty fussy on. Kyle especially can take a little more time at home. And maybe when you get to that show, it's not so bad when you're at a big show that's maybe seven or eight days, but if it's a quick in and out show, three, four days, the last thing you want is that hunter standing in the seat for hours on end and maybe taking away from that time that they can stand on the pack and eat. So if we can do the bulk of the clipping at home and then a run over at the show, that seems to be what works for us and the most beneficial. All 
All right. So one thing that I wanted to talk about in this presentation, because when we talk about a show program, I don't think this part really gets mentioned as often. But we're farmers, we're dairy farmers, we milk cows. We love to show heifers, but at the end of the day, they have to become milk cows. And for us, a heifer that lives alone in a pen her whole life, and then you try to tie up in the row, or you let go in the free stall, and your neighbor looks at <coughs> her sideways, and all of a sudden she's not coming up to eat, is not going to be a productive milk cow. So for us, letting our heifers be heifers, having time off to do so, is really important. After the show season, we have a rule. When we come home from the Royal, nothing goes back to the show barn. Everything goes back to that open front pack barn we looked at. They go into big groups, they compete, they go back on that 26% <coughs> twice a day, they go on a big square bale, and they have to learn to be heifers, like every other heifer. And that's our small calves that we're going to show as yearlings next year, and that's our yearlings that are going to become milk cows. That's just for us at the end of the day. Our goal is to make show heifers that become cows, and that's super important, I think, in making sure that that happens. So that is a, in a nutshell, overview of our show program and what it looks like. I'm sure there's a few questions somewhere along the line. Happy to answer a few. Happy to answer some questions after as well. So you guys let me know if you have any or if you want to talk later, but either way, we can do that. You want me to run? So I've been communicating a little bit with Erica, had given her some questions to kind of include in her presentation, but Erica, maybe walk us through, you keep two or three interns throughout the year. What's that process? How do you select them? How long are they there for? Yep, so typically we try to keep an intern for about three months. Um, we've had a few <laughs> different ways we've gone about it. And honestly, at this point, it's mostly through word of mouth. Uh, there are other interns that we've had previously. Um, we've built a, a good relationship with a few people over in Europe that we've had that will, will for sure be lifelong friends. Um, and they will recommend somebody that's up and coming over there, someone that's shown interest to come to Canada, and they will come over. Typically, we have three a year, I would say, probably somebody for those spring shows, those summer shows, and then the fall shows. Three months would be our typical term. Um, in all honesty, if you have one that works out really great, that feels really short. But if you have <coughs> somebody that maybe doesn't quite gel with your team, it's just long enough. So rather than keeping someone a year, we like to give many people the opportunity to come over and work with us that way. Um, who would you say for you, Matt, or for both of you, were maybe your mentors or the people that really drove your passion to do this? So, I think I have a two-part answer to that. So the first one I would have to say for me is that. Because, like I mentioned, I didn't grow up with cows, and I've always had a love for showing. But I needed to learn how to do that with cows. And I, I kept saying to him, I know how to show something, but tell me what I'm actually trying to achieve here. And we've become a really good team in, in doing that and making that all work. And then the other person I would have to say would be Marianne Jensen. Um, Marianne is phenomenal at what she does. She's one of our best friends, Marianne and Julian Shabbat. Um, so they would actually be the parents to Alex Shabbat, who works for us full time. Marianne is the one and the caretaker of Twix that we all saw this year. She's had more all Canadians and all Americans than I could probably shake a stick at, but she's been probably our biggest supporter, and she's really pushed us. We show in the same county, so at every little show we're there, and as much as we're not always on the same team, at the end of the day we are, and they always strive, pushing us to be better um, and encouraging us. And rather than trying to beat each other, we're both really there to help each other. Good. Um, what would you say 
what cow family or cow families have been the most influential within your herd? That's a pretty easy one for us, and I'd have to say elegance falling off the log. Um, we have a few different branches at our farm that we've, we've kind of developed in a few different directions. So for me, the first one would be Gold Trip Explosion, and I have to pick her first because she's my favorite, and uh, everyone on my team will tell you that that's the case. But that was my first heifer that I ever led that won the Royal. She's gone on to be an 88.2 year old, which was max score for us in Canada. And now she's breeding on the next generation. She, we had three full daughters out of her this year, in the last two years, in our junior herd. That was uh, honorable mention all American this year. She's making many nice daughters. She just sold choices and embryos, and, and she's really, really breeding on. And then we have a little bit of a different branch to the elegances as well, with another gold chip cow, Ellen, that we had bought in the very first Nashville Music City sale with our good friend, Sharon Petty Claire. And Ellen, Ellen came home, and I want to say we exported somewhere over 300 embryos out of Ellen um, to Japan. Ellen's Solomon daughter won the Royal that next two years later, be our first full crop out of Ellen. And after that, her embryos were in demand. Ellen, everyone she made Japan would buy. So we've had many daughters. And that espresso cow has gone on to win again as a yearling. And then as a cow, she was top five at Madison again this year in the, in the breeding three. Um, and then we do have a little smaller branch as well that would be a familiar family, would be the McCutcheon Emoji cow, Peter. Um, in Wisconsin, we had a gold chip sister to her jam that we have some nice daughters from as well. So elegance, for sure, front runner for us. Okay. You were talking about exporting embryos and things like that. So how do you decide which cows to flush? How often you flush them? Resulting embryos, do you have a set program where okay, we're going to freeze five or we're going to put five in, market the rest? How do you handle those decisions? Yep, so we, it's become actually quite a large part of our business, and we don't breed a lot of cows just to breed anymore. Um, large percentage, I would say 80 plus of our herd carry embryos. Um, we do have quite a large donor program, and it does start, we, we use all proven bulls. Our biggest market is Japan, so we, we've always really that way, Japan is a very small list of bulls that they will accept because they subsidize their, their farmers over there if they kind of purchase within the box that they, they've given them. So they, they need to be a proven bull, they need to be on the list, they need to be a certain cow family or a show winner. And if they can find those, the farmer in Japan is subsidized and they don't have to pay as much for the embryos. So we have really worked at buying donors, making donors, or matings that, that fit those. We have a few different brokers that we work with fairly extensively to export those embryos to Japan. And we also do a fair bit to Switzerland as well. We have a few friends over there that have really gotten into the embryo market. Um, they're big in some of the red stuff. But for us, proven cow families, proven bulls, um, a lot of the calves you can see around our farm are the C embryos or maybe D embryos from those resulting matings. And people will flush the odd cow just to make just to make daughters or to make calves, or if we want to use a bull maybe a little outside of that box for ourselves, something <coughs> something new or something popular. Um, you won't see a lot of young bull daughters at our at our place. It just doesn't really fit into our to our goals. So what we market towards. Yesterday over lunch we talked a little bit. I think this was an interesting concept. So tell us about the cow and why you sent a cow down to Adam Littles last week. Yeah, we did. We sent two down last week. So IVF is a big thing down here in the US. Um, it's, it's really not in Canada. You don't you don't see a lot of it. So when I refer to flushing for us that's Conventional flushing with sex semen. Um, and 
I'll throw in that Japan doesn't take IVF and not a lot of countries internationally will, so that's why we tend to go that way. But there is very small amounts of IVF. There, there are some satellite hubs that work through Logitech, but you don't see a lot of it. So we have two, two donors that create large amounts of oocytes, but don't fertilize. And with conventional flushing, they have to fertilize their own embryos. So we took a different approach. It's actually the first time we've done this. We're going to try something a little bit different. And we sent the two, two cows down to New York. And we're going to see how it goes. So we hope that by fertilizing in a different light, maybe we'll have a little better result. And part of the other reason those cows got moved the semen availability. So yep. talk about that a little bit too, maybe. Yeah, sometimes there's bulls that you guys can get down here and bulls that we can't get in Canada. Different health tests, different requirements. So by sending those cows down here, we can use a couple different bulls that we can't get at home. So we figured, why not? If they're going to be here, why not use that semen? Um, our embryos will be all exportable. We're going to ship a, a tank back home to us in Canada where we can put them ourselves into our own reships and grow the calves. So let's try and try and market something out of a different bowl that nobody else in Canada has. Um, so off the farm, what are some of the things that you and Matt enjoy doing or some of the different maybe groups or egg other outlets through ag that you guys are involved with? So, ag wise, I um, mentioned earlier that I'm the president of the John Dodge Bull Sheep Association. So, Matt and I have sat, sat on that association for the number of years. Um, we used to head up events like our Breeders Cup. We have a big barbecue in the summer, that sort of thing. Um, and I've since joined the Expo Committee. That's been fun. That's been interesting. I get to meet a lot of new different people. Um, hear how decisions are made, voice my opinion. I think that's been really great. And in all honesty, we, we don't have a lot of other hobbies. We really love, we love to show, that's what we do. Um, but we do enjoy time away from the farm as well, and we both have really enjoyed traveling. We, uh, my sister got married this past summer. She lives in Switzerland and was married in Italy. So for the first time ever, we left the farm for two weeks. And we traveled those countries and Ireland. And of course, we went to farms. Come on, that's what we do. But it was really, really neat. We got to do some of the growth side, and then we got to do some of the farm side. And we got to meet a few of the breeders that we had exported embryos to. Um, it, it was pretty cool to see our genetics over there in farms in Ireland, or people that we've met from Italy. It, it was neat. I think we'll definitely look at doing some more of that, traveling to some other countries and meeting some of those people. And what a great way to network. So um, as of late here, it, it seems that in Canada, the robots are kind of taking over. The farms are becoming a little more commercial and things like that. Where do you see Winright Holstein's being five? Where will they be five to ten years from now? We won't have a robot, I can tell you that. And not, not because I don't like robots, that's just not something that's in our plan. Um, you didn't see any pictures of our cow barn today, but we quite like our tide stall. It's in very good shape. We've done lots of upgrades over the years. We have large stalls. We use lots of bedding. We've added, we just added a piece about four years ago. So I don't think you will see us transition too much. Uh, for the business we're in, for showing cattle, I think the tide stall really shows off the cattle to the best of our ability. Um, no, it just that's robots. Just isn't something that's in in our plans and our goals. We'd like to continue breeding good cattle, showing good cattle. Um, we like our young stuff to calve in to make good calves, and I think you'll see us trying to improve that more than anything. So. Anyone from the floor, any questions or things you want to ask Erica that we haven't covered at this point? John? What is the net weight that would mean a call to my nutritionist? I'll be honest, I could not write that all off for you. And I wish I could. I could get you a tag and I could send it to you. But I don't know. 
<laughs> that would be more of a mat department or yeah, for nutrition. Bonnie? Do you have a parasite control program for your school members? Yeah, we do. Um, so that would be like a like like an Epronex or an Ivermectin. Yep. We do. So we typically the whole herd will get done in the spring and the fall, and then the show heifers will fall into that bracket as well. But they will probably get done once or twice more through the summer, just to stay ahead of it, um, keep on that coat, especially traveling around a lot. It is something we do on a very regular basis, and I would say they probably get done about four times a year through our show season period. Absolutely. Joseph. You said that the 40% pellets that you could feed more, how about more, and then you said some heifers are getting both, how do you work that? Yep, so with the 40%, like I said, they're getting about eight pounds of grain in total right now, and yes, you're right, I did say some are getting some more and some are getting others, so I think it's more breaking it down onto an individual heifer basis. So the heifer that needs to put on weight is going to get maybe we'll say all eight pounds of that 26% because they need that energy versus maybe that fat heifer that you're trying to put on a bit of a diet, but you want her to still grow because she's not the biggest. She's going to get all the 40%. And we will play with it a little bit in between, but I think, I don't know that I have a cookie cutter number for you, but it is something we'll play with. And we do have a lot of our young cats right now on a half and half. So I would say like four pounds of each. So they still have some of that energy in this cold, cold weather. Um, yet yeah, we're pushing that protein to keep them growing at the same time. Chip, Chip. Um, when you're getting heifers ready closer to the show and maybe one's a little heavier, do you adjust the, the grain or would you use straw or what, what's been your best mechanism to get them foamed up a little bit? We're not big straw fans. Um, we're pretty big on taking the leftover hay and moving that to maybe that heifer that you want to have on a diet and mixing it in. Um, I'm not saying we don't. Maybe maybe that fat jersey, she, she might like some straw or your big yearlings, but it's not something you'll see us do till late, late in the fall. We'll switch, we will transition that grain. Probably they're only getting I'm going to say a little handful of that 40%, not of the 26%, and we will clean out the feeders of the other heifers, and they can eat maybe those coarse pieces that are left, if we're really trying to take weight off quicker. What's the maximum number of heifers that you start into your show program that you carry through the summer and fall? That's a good question. And every year, we'd like to say it stays around 10 or 12, and we've never hit that number. We blow that out of the water every year. So right now, I think we have 15 heifers in the show barn. That would be a little higher than we'd like it to be. The perfect number in that pen to be happily full with two heifers in each pen is a dozen. Now, as the year progresses, we usually find by, for us, royal time, we have a big June calves. We start to bring in two. Our numbers start to creep up more to the 15 to 18 in just heifers. But that would be the top, the top end of what we would like. And I find if we start getting a little bit more than that, maybe they don't get as much individual care one-on-one -on -one as I'd really like to see them get, especially going into those big shows in the fall. A dozen would be a perfect number. We're really working on trying to keep it there. <laughs> and I think the other interesting thing that Erica shared when we were visiting yesterday, for a lack of a better term, at times they'll have an A and a B string of heifers. And you want to maybe elaborate on that just a little more. Your B yeah. string is more of a like a localized show group versus. Yeah, we do. So I mentioned my couple of team 4 Hers earlier, and they are great. We, we love to have them around, but they want to go to every every county fair and local show. And the last thing I want to do is discourage that. There, there's just no way. But when they pick their calf, the way our, our 4-H program works, I'm not entirely sure how yours works, but they have to pick one calf that they show all year. And 
for us, you probably know as well, if you drag that calf out every weekend or every other weekend, that calf's going to be small, they're going to be tired. It's just too much. So what we've kind of put into place is, without discouraging those girls, and I actually think it's helping those girls, is we've put together maybe a smaller group that feasting would be a, a perfect way to put it, that maybe they aren't the heifers we're going to take to Madison or the Royal, but I'm happy to go with those girls to that one or two day show, and they can show those three or four heifers, and they can learn, and I think in turn it's going to make them better showmen by learning to show different heifers. It's still good for win right to get out and, and show up at those events and support those kids, yet maybe when we go to Madison, those four heifers stay home, and your, your heifers that are going to those bigger shows are a little more fresh, they got to stay home, and it all kind of works out for everybody. I think our, we're nine o'clock, we need to kind of wrap things up, but is there anything else from the floor, anyone else have any questions? If not, Erica, thank you. Matt, we appreciate it. Uh, thanks for all your knowledge, and we appreciate you coming out. She had some delays coming in, so we deserve a little gift for you.